Reading in God's Word this morning from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, beginning in verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist upon its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. May God bless the reading of the word. Be seated, please. Well, I want to say just a word this morning to Noah Miner. Did an excellent job reading the scripture this morning, wouldn't you say, church? You know, uh, a lot of our older men could take a lesson right there. His last name is Miner, but he did a major job. Good job. A wise man once said these words, that most of us long for stronger, more creative, and rewarding ways of loving each other. You know, there's a lot of truth to that. We long for that. We want to have that in our life. And this series of lessons on Sunday morning dealing with the subject of love, I think is something that all of us think that we could improve on, and we probably need to do that. So let me ask you a question at the very outset of the lesson today. Is there love without action? No, there's not. To just say we have love without any action really does not define what love is. And so for us to say that we are a loving congregation, we must really demonstrate that to those around us. You know, I like to use the word guest when someone comes into our assembly for the first time. You know, when you have a guest at your home, you're the one that does the inviting, you're the one that invites them in, and you're the one that offers them something. And so we have guests, and we want to be friendly, we want to be warm, we want to be loving to our guests of people that come to our congregation. And so we want to experience that love, and we only experience that love when we give that love to someone else. It is one thing to say, oh, we're a friendly, loving congregation. But are we? That's the question we have to answer. Are we that loving congregation to people that come here that are new, moving into our community, and how we want to have them with us and work in labor here? So how is love given? Well, in very short answer, it would be we do that through love. We do that by showing love and giving love to other people. I like one of the versions from Proverbs chapter 24, verses 3 through 4. Any enterprise is built by wise planning and becomes strong through common sense and also profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts of what we're dealing with. That's what Solomon says in Proverbs about what we are supposed to be. This biblical uh, proverb is particularly useful as we assign our definition of what love is. The approach to intentionally loving someone. Now, I want to just pause for just a moment and tell you, and I don't want everybody to think now, oh, Steve's hinting that this is something that ought to happen. I'm just telling you this is how it was, okay? Someone did something really nice for me last week. They called up and they brought something to our home. Didn't know it, didn't expect it, was shocked by it, and if I called their name, they would be extremely embarrassed, so I'm not going to do it. But you know, that was something that was done, how? Intentional. They made a point to do it. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of effort. Sometimes it's easy to love people. Sometimes it takes more ingenuity. It takes more effort. It takes time to say, I am going to intentionally love that person. I'm going to make an effort to show my love to that person. So I hope that we will become a congregation that intentionally loves people and that we do something to show that intentional love. Being God's love channel, as we talked about three weeks ago, we are the channels of God's love. We are the ones that have to go out. We're the ones that get to go out and share that love with other people. So don't panic when I say this. I have eight things I want to share. 
But I'm not going to do them all today, okay? <laughs> Maybe we'll get to four of them, possibly five, if I don't wander off into a, a sidebar. So seriously, when we follow the steps of what it means to be a loving person, and I want you to think about these. We might get this done today. Because to love in Jesus' name means that we are able to accept regardless the consequence that comes to ourselves. And it will be the most important thing, I believe, that we've ever done. When we intentionally desire and make an effort to love someone. So step number one, if you're taking notes, you'll have them on the screen. It'll be easy to take a card and jot these down. And I uh, hope you will. The step one I want you to suggest this morning is to make a love covenant with God. That you will make a love covenant with God. Now remember, a covenant is a promise that God makes with us. But there's also a party that has to be involved in that. And that's who we are. Without serious commitment to making a love commitment to God, none of our principles of love are going to work. They're simply not going to work. Love is a lifestyle. It's not something that is on again, off again. It is an activity. It is a covenant that God keeps with us. It is a covenant that we ought to keep with Him. It is our personal statement to God that we are going to keep our commitment to love other people and our desire for renewal, rededication, whatever it may be, to what He calls us to do as well as what He wants us to be. When, when you make a love covenant with God, you're telling Him personally that you are willing to do that. That you are willing, like the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, just the next chapter, verse 1, he says, you make love to make love your aim. That you aim to be a person of love. That you desire to do that. You make that the focus of who you are. Well, a love covenant with God is, is the same faithful intent that God has for us, His people. God will not break His covenant with His people. He will not do that. And so we have a great model to follow after. Listen to what Isaiah said in the 45th chapter, chapter 45, verse 10. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be moved, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken nor my covenant of peace be removed. That's from Isaiah. And he's telling us this is what God is thinking about us as his people. You might find it helpful to just write out your love covenant with God. My covenant with you today is I am going to try to embrace this situation and I'm going to make it an effort that I am going to do something intentional. I am going to show your love, God, through me to other people. That would be a great love covenant. You might want to think about doing that one. And so the second step is that we need to identify those specifically who need your love. Now you may have made a list of some people that you think you might want to endeavor to uh, break the ice a little bit and decide I'm going to intentionally love that person. I don't know them very well, but I'm going to start doing that. And maybe you just want to make that love connection, but you haven't done it yet. And if you've not made a specific list, might I encourage you this week to say, you know, um, in years past, we've been really good about uh, maybe inviting people into our home. I think we've ridden the COVID train just about far enough, don't you, church? That it's time for us to get back to having people in our house, inviting them for a meal, a simple sandwich, some chips, something to drink. It doesn't have to be elaborate because that puts a lot of pressure on our wives. And so we do something simple and we just say, let's have a few people over and get to know someone. That might be a great way to start your love covenant with someone. And so make that list and be sure to include Christians, but also non-Christians. This is not something that we just want to keep to ourselves. We want to share this love with people that are outside the body of Christ and invite them into our home perhaps and share with them. Remember, we are the delivery system of God's love. So if you're not letting that love go out of you, you're not sharing God's love. That's the bottom line. And so we need to be people that we reach out to our friends, our associates, our enemies, and those in need. Those are people that are waiting on us to deliver his love. And let me just ask you this. If you and I don't do it, 
Who's going to do it? You see, if we don't do it, who's going to show God's love to other people? Well, in making your connection list, let's start with next. Let's start with, how about someone in your family? Maybe someone that you need to get to know better. You've been estranged a little bit. Ooh, that would be a great thing to patch that up and get back with your family members. And then list your close friends, people that you enjoy being with, someone that you might invite over for a, a, a little dinner or something fast after evening service, perhaps. And then those that you invite over, uh, that would be a great place to start. Next, you, you look Look at your connection list and those are just acquaintances. Well, who would those be? Maybe someone that you've met at the doctor's office. Maybe someone you've met at the gas station. Maybe someone in an, uh, in an aisle somewhere at the grocery store or wherever it may be that you've just come in contact with and, and you say, hey, we kind of have a connection here. I'd like to invite you over and then I'd like to invite you to our worship service. You know, that's not very comfortable for some people. But for you, it might be just the thing that would break the ice. And then fourth, it might be church members. Someone that sits over here and you're over there. Or maybe you're here and they sit right there. Or wherever. And you might think, I know that person from a distance, but I don't really know them. So how can I know them better? These may be non-members. They may be members of the congregation already. And then I want you to think about number five, people that um, may not be in any of these specific categories that I've shared, but, has, but these people that have a need in which you can respond to. So that could be just about anybody. Of course, there are differences between all of these five groups of people. You see that on the screen. They're all different. And somehow we relate to all of them, don't we? We see them. We can automatically think of a name of someone that we ought to visit with and do that. The closer these connections are to us, such as families and close friends, the more permanent those relationships are. But the more distant connections are the one that are, those are harder to do, but doesn't mean that they're not still needed that we launch out in the deep and decide we're going to do that. So let me refresh your memory this morning with that definition of love again that we've been working with for the last several weeks. Intentionally doing something, caring for someone, or helpful for another person, and doing that in Jesus' name, regardless of the cost or the consequence to oneself. Now, you know, the thing is, when you invest heavily in people... It can grow tiring. It can. It can physically tire you. It can mentally, spiritually tire you. But you know, this is very valuable to think about this morning. I'm glad that Jesus invested in me. And I hope you're glad that Jesus invested in you. And that we intentionally do something to show his love. This definition provides opportunities for loving people in every category that you saw on the screen. I'd like for you to review that name or those names that you have on the list and be thinking about who you want to intentionally reach out and share God's love. Family, friends, acquaintances, enemies, needy, whoever they might be. And begin to practice love and put action behind it. It is important. And then number three this morning, I want to suggest that we begin to be the one that acts first. We put this plan into motion first, and we decide to do that. That was one of the very early lessons in this little series we're doing. Don't wait for the other person. Always act as though there is your responsibility, and that the initiation comes from you rather than someone else. Now, you know, if everybody in this congregation just sits back and says, well, nobody's talking to me, how's that going to help us? <laughs> it's not. So we initiate that and we begin to ask, how can I do that? Let me just share with you a, a, a personal thing that this might be true in your life, okay? Oftentimes, oftentimes, we wait for someone else to initiate the first step. We do. We wait for someone else. Have you ever been guilty of doing this? Well, I see her. I see him coming down the hallway. I, I wonder, is he going to stop and talk to me? I don't know if she's going to speak to me today. 
You see, when we initiate first, we don't have to think about that. We're the one that does the initiating of being friendly and being this conduit of love. The second thing is, well, maybe, maybe they didn't smile at me today. You know, I get busy greeting a lot of people before and after services, and sometimes I don't get to see people, and someone says, well, you know, the preacher didn't even speak to me today. Hey, church, I can't speak to 700 people. But you can come up and speak to me, perhaps, and then I can speak to you another time, and in the end, it's all going to be fine. But we should not sit back and wait for someone to come speak to us before we initiate that. That's called having a personality. That's called having a friendly factor in your life and getting out of a comfort zone and beginning to speak with someone. And we should not have to wait for someone to speak to us first. We should not have to wait for someone to invite us over first. Maybe we need to be the ones to initiate that. And when it comes to intentional love, we always act first. Just think if a guest came into this assembly, let's say they're traveling, they're on a vacation, spring break's coming, and they stop by and worship with us in the morning, and God forbid that anyone would ever leave this building without someone speaking to them intentionally. Because you see, they're a guest in our home. So the people that are in the home are the ones that are to extend the friendlies to the guest. Does that make sense? Can you imagine having someone over for dinner, a sandwich and some chips after supper, and you sit there at the table and you don't even speak to them for 40 minutes? And you say, hey, good to have you over. See you later. <laughs> that wouldn't be very warm and friendly, would it? Well, when a guest is in our house, we need to be the person who initiates the being friendly. Step four this morning is to communicate. It goes along with what I've been trying to say already. Research indicates that people believe the most important ingredient for a loving relationship is this word. Communication. Communication. Talking, speaking with someone. And as communication grows, guess what happens as a result of that? Love grows. And when we communicate with someone, our love for one another grows even more. And there's various levels of this communication that we can find ourselves as we interact. In a sense, we would call these the little stepping stones that we're involved in to learning to be friendly and help people. And so sometimes we cannot wait for others. And as we begin to intentionally reach out and say something to someone and visit with them, we have to ask ourselves, on what level do I initiate? On what level do I communicate with folks at the congregation where I attend? That's a good question for me. That's a good question for you. On what level do you do that? So let me just share what some of those might be. Maybe you'll see yourself in one or more of these categories. The first one is, the first level of communication is just exchanging cliches. You know what those cliches are, don't you? Hey, how you doing this morning? And you're gone, just like that. You're gone. You haven't even waited for a, a friendly response of anything, whether you feel like it or not. Most of the time, people say, fine, how are you doing? And they're walking off down the aisle. They're going down the hallway. That's just surface communication. The second level is that of a person sharing some kind of information or perhaps some kind of data, talking about things that are important, talking about non-threatening things. Hey, how about them cowboys? You know, I've been saying this since 1995. <laughs> How's the weather? Hey, it's going to change tomorrow. You know, things like that. Not a whole lot of information, just sharing something along. The, uh, a television program, that's just talking very quickly about something. The next level, we begin to do something a little bit more. We begin to share our opinions with someone. Maybe we begin to share our attitudes with someone. How about a dream or a goal that we want to have in our life? And maybe we even get to, uh, to the sur below the surface and we start sharing some values that we have with someone. See, now we're getting past the cliches to the point to where you really know someone. So if I were to ask you this morning this question, and please don't answer out loud, but within five feet circle of where you're sitting right now, how well do you know the person next to you? And I'm not talking about your husband and wife, son, daughter. How well do you know those people? You've sat on that same pew with them for two years. 
And so we must get past that. We must get to the point to where we share our love. We are the conduit of God's love. And then this most intimate level next is the level of communication where we share more of our feelings, our emotions, our joys, and even our fears with those that are next to us. That's where we get down to the nitty gritty. And so this, there's a difference in all of these levels that we must experience. And the intimacy that we want to have in this comes from another level. It is this idea of communicating well enough to say, I love you. I've had more people tell me they love me in the last three weeks than any nine, in the nine years I've been here. I, and I know it's a direct re, uh, relation to this lesson, and maybe you've experienced the same thing. And so we need to keep that up. We need to keep doing that and mean it when we say it. Sometimes we communicate very well with first and beginning relationships, and then we're on this first or second level, but we need to go deeper. Try moving from our present level, wherever you are. Try moving to the next level. Get out of your comfort zone a little bit. Risk a little bit and say, I'm going to do better. Go beyond the cliches. Talk about more than the, the weather or the sports. And stretch yourself beyond intellectual ideas and take an initiative toward sharing some feeling that you have, perhaps about a scripture, a verse, a, a passage in the Bible that means something to you. And then in that, admit your fears. I don't know that I'm doing well with that. I don't know that I'm doing as good on that as I should, and I need to be better, and I need to focus about that. Will you pray for me about that? Now we're really getting personal, aren't we? Because we just told someone, I'm struggling. Hey, guess what? We're all strugglers. We all struggle. And some do better than others, and some need to improve. And so we work on this, stretch ourselves a little bit, take the initiative, the beginning step to do that. I want to share some startling statistics with you. I hope this does shock you. A sociologist recently conducted a survey that told how much time family members spend, listen, in meaningful communication. Meaningful communication. At the very low end of the scale, he found that the average American father spends six minutes a week really communicating with his teenage son or his daughter. Isn't that amazing? Only six minutes a week, and we feel that that's deep, intimate, close relationships. And next he found that the average husband and wife spend 29 minutes a week in meaningful dialogue. Now, you might think, oh, that can't be right. Well, you put a pencil to it today. How many hours you're asleep? How many hours you're at work? How many hours you're out doing this in the yard or in the garage or some errand that you've got to do? And then you have just a little bit of time during the week and you total that up. And you're going to find out on average. Now, that means some do more. It means some do less than 29 and so when you think about that, where are we in our relationship speaking to our family? Studies indicate that men have more of a particular trouble in sharing themselves than women. Well, we know the reason why, because, uh, and I don't mean this disrespectful, but women seem to have a larger amount of words to share. You know, I, and, and that's not meant to be a, a, oh, you're laughing in the wrong place, fellas. You are so laughing in the wrong place. But men, we don't talk as much. And so it's harder for us to initiate something to say meaningful to our spouse. And so perhaps we could do better. And then a study also found that 75% of women interviewed could without hesitation name at least one close friend that they had. Most women can name one close friend that they have. 75%. That's a pretty good number. But listen to this, slightly over 66% of men could not name someone that was a close friend. Guys, you think we're just a little tight and pent up sometimes? We're just a little pent up and tight. 
And maybe we need to relax a little bit so we can open up this love conduit to share our love with other people. Leading psychologists estimate that only 10% of the adult males in the United States have anyone in which they can intimately share information with. No wonder we're a disjointed country. No wonder the church could do better in our relationships with one another. Well, how do we improve our communication? We do it actively listening, be quick to hear and slow to speak, James says. An open ear is the only believable sign of an open heart, another person said. A preacher once said these words, the first duty of love is to listen. The first duty of love is to listen. We are all, for the most part, we, most everyone has the capacity to hear, but very few have the capacity to listen. There's a big difference in hearing and listening. Good listening requires concentration on what someone is sharing with us. It means forcing ourselves and focusing exclusively on what the other person is trying to communicate to us. Remember is another thing. If you have trouble remembering, take notes. I want to just share a little secret with you that I do. It's nothing new. Probably other people have done it. But in the front of my Bible, I have a little yellow post-it note. Can you all see that right there? When a name is read in this church for someone that's placed membership, I take my pencil out and I write their name right then. Because you know what happens when we get home? Now, who was that that placed membership today? What was their name? And it's another week before their picture's in the bulletin and their name and address is listed there. And so maybe we should be more proactive in listening and writing down some things that would help us along the way. Well, I, uh, I'm at the next point and we're going to move on. And the act is remembering and then we're going to talk about honesty. To really make a concentrated effort at being honest about who we are. There's a very old book now, and I'm, I'm dating myself by telling you this because many of you probably have it on your shelf at home, and you can probably pick it up at a, a bookstore if you'd like. It's called The Friendship Factor by McGinnis, M-C, capital G-I-N-N-I-S. It calls it Cultivating Transparency. And this is the idea of just being honest. You know how you might begin by being honest in this congregation? I have introduced myself to people in this church that have been going here uh, since the crust of the earth cooled. <laughs> and uh, y'all know them, but I don't. And so I, oh, well, Brother Steve, I've been going here for seven years. I've been going here for 25 years. I go, I went over, and you know what? We are transparent when we do that. But you know, if you do not risk being transparent, you will never meet them. You may introduce yourself to them two times before you finally get it in your head who they are. And then you write their name down. See, just being transparent. Say, oh, yes, I remember now. We met earlier out in the foyer or we met in Bible class one day. Hey, who hasn't done something like that? We've all done that. So we become transparent. And then the very last thing this morning before we close I want to share with you is that we need to empathize with other people. Empathy. What a great word. We need to empathize with where people are and what they're doing. I want to close this morning by telling you a true story. And I hate to say that because it, it's almost like everything I've told you before has not been true. But this is a true story, okay? This, was really hap this really happened. The man's name was Manuel Garcia. He was featured and fearing um, what was going to happen to him because he was, he was a person who had cancer. And he was going under cancer treatments and he was afraid that he was going to have patches of hair fall out on his head. And so he decided that he was just going to go to the barber and he was just going to have his head shaved. And he had it shaved all across and he was just, just no hair on his head whatsoever. And he said, I feel self-conscious. I don't know if anyone will speak to me. How is my family going to feel? And so before uh, Garcia left the hospital in Milwaukee, his friends and three of his relatives came walking into the hospital room and all four of them had their heads shaved. And Garcia looked up from the bed and he said, automatically, I started laughing. He started, I started laughing uncontrollably because here I have my head shaved and now my four friends that came to see me, their head has been shaved. <laughs> 
And then he said, when they left the hospital, they went to the house and all of his family was gathered there and all the men in the family had taken uh, razors and clippers and they had shaved their head and he walked in the door and he was just amazed. He said, I felt the people empathized with me. You know what I call that? I call it love. I call it love. And Garcia had a 15-year-old son with beautiful dark hair. And he said, Dad, I'm going to shave my head too because I want you to know how much I love you. Wow. Now, I'm not advocating we all go shave our heads. Don't miss the point. But the point is, can we do a good job, a better job with empathizing with people instead of telling them what they should have done or giving them instructions on what you ought to do? Could we just listen and empathize? I think we'd all be better off. I'm so thankful this morning that Jesus Christ empathizes with me. He knows all my struggles. He knows everything about me. And he knows everything about you. It might be someone this morning is here in this audience who's looked at your life and you're saying, there's things I need to do differently. You know your level of communication. But could I just close this morning by telling you, you know the level of communication that Jesus has for your heart. He stretched out his hands this far and they nailed him to a cross. And he said, I love you this much. This morning, maybe you're ready to give your life to Jesus. We stand ready to help you if you're subject to the invitation of the gospel. Would you stand and will you come?